Great, so yes, my name is Kent C. Dodds. Um, I work at PayPal. I'm from Utah, a whole bunch of other stuff about me. Um, all of these things are linked, so if you're curious what this thing is or whatever, um, that, that's a link to my slides, kcd.im slash write-test-slides. So um, this talk is uh, entitled Write Tests Not Too Many, Mostly Integration, and that um, comes from a tweet from Guillermo Rausch. We'll look at that here in a second. Actually, you saw it oh, um, earlier today. Um, and yeah, that's what the whole talk is about, is dissecting that. We're going to talk about high-level principles of testing. We're not really going to get into frameworks um, or specifics of, um, of testing tools. Um, and it is opinionated. Like every single talk at this conference, it's actually really interesting, the different opinions that, that uh, the speakers have presented, uh, which is one of the things I like about testing. Uh, there are so many different use cases, different ways to do things. Um, this talk is not going to be bashing on other met methodologies or tools. It is unfortunately not full of GIFs, and it's not a 750 or 25 slides. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I can't even imagine how much. He probably did write that program that he was talking about at the end that generated all those slides for him. It's crazy stuff. OK, so let's go ahead and jump in. So this is the more than famous tweet from Guillermo Rausch, write tests, not too many, mostly integration. When Gleb showed that, the tweet had 180-something retweets. So it's, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty popular, I guess. Um, so let's, let's dive into what this means. We'll start with write tests. I think most people here are cool with the, the idea of writing tests. I don't think I really need to convince anybody that it's a good idea to write tests. Um, but I am going to present kind of the, the two reasons that I think it's important to write tests. Uh, the first one is it gives us enhanced workflows. It makes our, like if you're using TDD, or um, Brian showed me this like test driven with Cypress thing uh, yesterday. It just like kind of blew my mind. Um, it really can enhance your workflow um, as you're developing your software. It can make you more productive. Um, but what I want to talk about more in this talk is the confidence that your test can give you. The confidence that your application is going to work and that it, it will work according to the specifications that uh, you wrote it for in the first place. Uh, Jason this morning was talking about how uh, he's using PagerDuty. PayPal also uses PagerDuty. The last thing that you want is for it to wake you up at 4 a.m. Um, or when you are wakeboarding. Um, oh shoot, I've got to fix this bug, guys. Oh, well. Uh, okay. <laughs> Just like, he totally gives up. You could see it on his face. He's like, well, I guess this laptop is ruined now. So that, that's why we write tests, is, is for that confidence that it can give us so that we can rest easy. Uh, we don't have to uh, do really in, uh, difficult deploys um, when we're like deploying to production that takes two weeks of an engineer's time. Um, it, tests can really help us build that con confidence. Um, so this bit, not too many. So uh, let's talk about code coverage. Code coverage is the metric that we generally use to determine um, how many tests we have or how, how well our uh, code is covered. If you're not familiar with this, it's um, a code coverage report by Istanbul. And that's kind of the de facto standard for coverage in, in uh, JavaScript. And here's a specific uh, file. It's showing us, hey, you never, your tests never ran this line of code. And so uh, you should maybe add a test, and then you can um, uh, cover that line of code. Or, or you didn't cover the else case of this if statement. And so that's, that's what code coverage is. So the question is, well, how much code coverage do you need in your, your project? What percentage is a good one? I hear this question a lot. And it's a great one. And just like every other answer that you hear in your business class uh, that I heard in my business class was, it depends. Uh, it, it really does depend. Do you all remember this from earlier? This was one of my favorite um, slides from, um, from this conference because it actually, because I, I was like, sweet, I can use this in my talk. <laughs> So this is so true. It's, it's really easy to get good code coverage instantly. Um, you just like require the file, and you have a whole bunch of code coverage, especially if it's not too complicated. But after a while, it tends to, like the return on your time um, doesn't give you the same amount of coverage. And so what that sweet spot is that um, Aaron was talking about is um, there, there's some level where it makes sense to uh, focus on coverage 
um, or versus like focusing on shipping features. So if you're working for a company that where it's super, super important, nothing ever breaks, then you'll probably be on the right side of that line a little bit. Um, if you're at a startup that's just trying to churn out a product because you need to get funding, then maybe on the left side a little bit. Um, if you're writing a library, uh, like Aaron said, 100% code coverage is generally pretty uh, simple, especially if it's a small library. So on, um, I publish um, like over 100 packages on NPM, and almost all of them have 100% code coverage because it's pretty easy uh, generally to get that. But for applications, uh, I'm not even going to give you a number. I've given numbers before, and like, it, it's there's no number. Um, one thing that I would, uh, or one reason that I am nervous about 100% code coverage in applications, and, and I've seen teams that enforced 100% code coverage in an application, what inevitably will happen is you start testing implementation details so that you can just cover that edge case that is like really weird and you have to do these really weird things. And so you start exposing private functions or you start doing a bunch of weird things just to get this 100% um, this code coverage metric, which uh, winds up doing a couple of things. Um, so you can tell whether you're testing implementation details if uh, your test is doing something that the consumer of the code would never do, like using a private function, for example. Uh, you, you just expose this just for the test. Well, um, yeah, that's, that's an implementation detail of that module. So it, it, like, um, yeah, that can be a problem. And the reason that it's a problem is um, when you're testing implementation details, change, refactoring the code, make, making the implementation the same, but changing how that implementation works is going to break your tests. And this is going to make people not like testing. And I think we can all agree here that we're, after this conference, we're going to spread out into the world and we're going to be like, testing is the best. And none of us wants people to not like testing. Um, we want, we want um, testing to have a good reputation. And by testing implementation details, you're not helping. So avoid that. Uh, so that's why we, we say not too many. Um, so then mostly integration. So here's where things get a little bit opinionated. Um, so <clears throat> the testing pyramid, I added this um, after today uh, because, I mean, everybody's got to have a testing pyramid. So this is the standard testing pyramid. Um, here's the Gleb pyramid. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie, for taking this photo. Thank you. Um, I snagged that from Twitter. And uh, here's the Aaron Square. <laughs> Saw this from today. Carrie also. And this is the testing Dorito. So it, you probably can't read it, so I'll read it for you. It says, tests I plan to write, tests I start writing, tests I delete because I decide they are stupid and take more time than they are worth, and then tests. <laughs> uh, this, actually, I really like this a lot. Um, it reflects reality um, f of uh, lots of developers really well. So I am going to give you a whole new thing to learn about. This is something that I, I was thinking about a lot uh, recently, and I created. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Sorry. I, I switched the order of my slides just like right before my talk. So we're going we're gonna to get to that here in a second. So, <laughs> so let's talk about the different forms of testing first. Um, static code analysis. Uh, I think Gleb mentioned uh, today that a static code analysis is a form of testing. So if you're using a tool like ESLint to catch simple bugs like um, this no undef rule, like that's, that's a really, really um, great way to catch a bunch of bugs that like, entirely removes a whole suite of tests that you never need to write because you're, you're linting against those. And the really cool thing about static testing uh, tools or static analysis tools is you don't have to actually run your application or any of your code for them to be valuable. Um, one place where um, a tool like ESLint is totally invaluable is uh, linting against semicolons and like stylistic stuff. Just like Jason said, just install Prettier and don't like break the build because somebody forgot a stinking semicolon. Okay, so then we have Flow, and Flow um, actually does an even better job of uh, eliminating a whole category of tests. Um, here, we're passing in this three variable into the subtract function. It's expecting a number, and so Flow is catching that for us. Um, you can also use TypeScript for uh, this static uh, type checking. But uh, 
um, yeah, the, the idea of these static code analysis tools is that they can eliminate a whole category of tests that you never need to write. I never need to write a test for the subtract function to see what happens if I pass an, uh, um, a string instead of a number. Um, so that's pretty cool. The problem with this is uh, these tools can't really test any business logic. So that's why our, where we move into unit tests. So unit tests, they're pretty simple. We've seen a lot of the, these today. Uh, I think we've probably seen, I think Justin actually showed basically this. I'm pretty sure he copied my slides. Um, no, just kidding. But uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty simple. Um, they, they can get a little bit more complex if you start wanting to mock a bunch of things. Um, but uh, yeah, generally pretty simple. Then you have integration tests. Uh, these generally take a little bit more setup. Here we're starting a server, we're resetting a database. Uh, we have to make sure we close the server so we don't like, have a memory leak or something. Um, and then we can do our tests and we're like, making actual requests and things like that um, to our API. So integration tests are really great because they're definitely testing a whole lot of your business logic, the stuff that actually will break um, and, and can cause like, serious problems. Uh, but as far as like, the setup is concerned, it's actually not a whole lot. Um, it's probably more uh, generally than, than a unit test would be. Um, but it's still not like ar too arduous. And then we have our end-to-end -end tests. And um, this is using Cypress because it's the only end-to-end -end test tool you'll ever need for browser testing. Um, it is so good, by the way. Um, so here we're just, uh, we have this little fake user. We're visiting our application. We're typing in the form. And then we're verifying that the, that the user was redirected when they registered and that um, their username um, is properly displayed. OK, cool. So here's the testing trophy. Ta-da! So um, this, if I could change one thing about the testing trophy, it would be I'd probably make the end-to-end -end test a little bit bigger. Um, but it was really hard for me to make this, so I didn't remake it. Um, but this isn't intended to be like a hard fast, like this is how you, or like the ratios. So don't try to figure out like geometrically what the ratios here are, because that would be silly. Um, but this is the general idea. So you have your static tests, um, and those should just be natural, and, and they're pretty easy to set up, especially ESLint. You don't have to do a whole lot. Um, with, with typing JavaScript, so with TypeScript or Flow, it, it takes a little bit more effort. Uh, but then you have your unit tests, and those are really valuable. Don't do away with, with unit tests. But integration tests take this big spot in the middle, and I'll explain why here in a second. And then we have our end-to-end -end tests. So uh, with, with the testing pyramid and with the testing trophy, uh, one of the, the f things about it is that as you move up the trophy, you're going to go from tests that are really cheap to write and run, all the way up to tests that are crazy expensive to write and run. And Cypress is doing a great job of making it less expensive, but it still is going to be more expensive than just like um, adding some types or writing a unit test for, uh, for some um, simple function. So um, that's one property of, of the testing trophy. Another is as you go um, from the bottom to the top, your tests are going to get slower. Uh, it, it's so much faster to just like run a node process than to pull up a full browser and, and run that. Um, hopefully, that will get faster um, in, with our, our tools. Um, but still, it's going to be faster to, to have these lower level tests. So, so far, if you just look at these, you're going to say, well, why don't I just do like static for everything? Because they're cheap and they're faster. It makes a lot of sense. But the, the one thing that we haven't talked about yet is what I call the confidence coefficient. So as you move up the testing trophy, your confidence coefficient also goes up. And so the, the things at the bottom are intended to solve really simple problems. Um, so like I passed a string instead of a number. That's, that's a pretty simple problem. Um, and generally, you'll catch that pretty quickly, um, even if you didn't have the, um, uh, the test in place or the, the static um, analysis in place. Um, but the end-to-end -end tests are going to catch your big problems, like, oh, the checkout button doesn't work. That's like an enormous problem, because it would cost us millions of dollars a minute, because nobody can check out. So um, the reason that I say um, integration, like mostly integration, uh, or the reason I agree with Guillermo, um, is because they, they, I feel like they provide the best balance of tests that are uh, cheap, they uh, run quickly, and um, they, solve, they can help you solve bigger problems. 
Um, they, they can't help you solve all of the problems, but uh, definitely I, I uh, feel like they have a really good balance of, of the three uh, properties. And our, our tools are getting better so that each one of these properties are improving as well. Um, so like I said, you, you don't do away with your unit tests. Keep those. Those are really important, really valuable. What Justin was showing was like really cool as a way to, to uh, develop a well-designed system. So I, I think those kinds of things are, are valuable still. Um, and definitely keep your end-to-end -end tests going. Those are really great for your happy path. Make sure that all of those things, things still work. And then your integration tests just sit nice in the middle. Um, so a big question that I get about like the unit versus integration test is how do I do it? Like the difference is so fuzzy. It's as Justin said, it's loosey goosey. Uh, so how do you write more integration tests um, and like not write quite as many unit tests? Or how do you change a unit test to an integration test? The biggest thing is poke fewer holes in reality. And, th and that was something that Justin mentioned in his talk as well. Um, the, the more holes that you poke in reality, the instant you poke a hole in reality, you have zero confidence around that hole, um, unless you, you fill that in with some other test. And so by this, I mean um, using some mocking, or if you're doing React, the shallow rendering thing. Um, I really don't like shallow rendering, like a lot. Come and ask me about it later. But we, um, yeah, I definitely avoid um, um, poking holes in reality unnecessarily. Uh, and then the other is to test higher up your tree. So instead of um, just like taking a snapshot of your button component that literally just renders a button, I don't care about that test, to be perfectly honest. Um, why don't you render like your page, like your settings page, and then click around on, uh, like you can simulate clicks around on that uh, page and um, make some verifications like, oh, when the user uh, username input is incorrect, uh, or like when it's invalid, then the submit button is disabled. Um, and you can test that integration a lot easier if you just test higher up in your tree. And you can cover all of the same things that you would cover if you took snapshots of your button component. Um, yeah, not, not super useful. And you can cover it with the integration tests. So just a big thank you to Guillermo for tweeting this uh, back in December of 2016. I think it's awesome. It made me kind of rethink some of the things that I, I decided about testing. And I hope that was helpful to you as well. Thank you.